All right. Good afternoon. If you're on the East Coast, going to give everybody just a couple of seconds to log in and join us. Um, this topic is on addressing disparities in kidney health and transplant uh, for Black patients. Uh, so we'll be joined by two Clarksdale High alums and a rapping New Jersey peach. And uh, so they can they can maybe uh, expound upon that a little bit. Um, just a couple of announcements. One, we will have today is the last day to apply for the NMQF 40 under 40. So we'll put that link for that in the uh, comment section. You have about until 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. So you have if you're on the East Coast, you have till 8. Um, and then uh, two, if you have questions that you want to ask of the group, though, we'll ask those in the last um, quarter of the program, but just put it in the Q&A chat at the bottom. But if you want to comment and just chat along, please do that. Use that in the chat function. And uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to our first uh, Clarksdale High alum, Dr. Megan Thompson. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm super excited to be here in the presence of two phenomenal women who I know is going to speak so eloquently on this issue. And I'm ready to listen and learn some things. And I know that this is going to be a great treat for you. Um, this panel discussion will delve into the critical issues of disparities of kidney health and transplant access among Black individuals. Despite advancements in healthcare, Black communities continue to face significant barriers in accessing quality kidney care and transplant services. Um, this panel aims to shed light on the root causes of these disparities and explore access actionable strategies to promote equity and improve outcomes for Black individuals living with kidney disease. I am going to be your moderator today, um, Megan Thompson, Senior Health Policy Advisor for Congresswoman Robin Kelly, um, and I will turn it over to Ms. Morgan Reed to introduce herself. Megan, thank you so much um, for this opportunity, and thank you to the National Minority Quality Forum um, for sharing their platform. My name is Morgan Reed. I am the Director of Transplant Policy and Strategy with the National Kidney Foundation. I always joke and say my name is Morgan, rhymes with organ, organ Morgan, you can't forget my name. Um, I am a kidney recipient. I know what it's like to be diagnosed with chronic kidney disease. I spent almost two years on peritoneal dialysis and 17 years ago, my best friend in college donated her kidney to me. Um, we celebrated our kidneyversary on January 9th. So I'm very passionate about kidney health. Before joining the National Kidney Foundation, I spent 10 years working for two different organ procurement organizations. I had the privilege of working for Emory Transplant Center. And I am continuing to advocate for kidney patients in my role, again, at uh, the National Kidney Foundation. So actually, this is how I honor my friend Kelly, who donated her kidney to me. This is me paying it forward. So again, thank you so much for this opportunity and um, happy Black History Month. Happy to be on this panel. Amazing. Thank you for that and sharing your story. Um, Dr. Laura Williams, please introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Uh, this, uh, too, is an honor for me uh, to join uh, this panel. Um, thanks to, you know, the National Minority um, Quality Foundation, because this is, again, an excellent opportunity to sort of shed light on a, on a topic that I think is, uh, is quite meaningful. Uh, I am an internist by training uh, with subspecialty training in infectious diseases. Uh, currently um, work, working as the chief medical officer at Ardelix, uh, have been involved in drug development for the last uh, 30 years or so, and um, I'm really excited about, again, this topic, particularly uh, in the kidney space, um, where we know uh, the health disparities uh, are, are no enormous. I mean, when you think about um, the fact that we have about 800,000 patients, you know, who have kidney failure uh, and that there is a fourfold a higher rate among Blacks. Um, that's, that's, that's striking. And then when you look at the number of transplants um, that happen in that population, um, 1.6 times more likely to get a transplant if you're white than if you're Black. And two and a half times more likely to get a transplant if you are white than if you are a non-white Hispanic. And so when we talk about these disparities, um, they are real. And we talk about the social determinants of health. Um, and one of those determinants, I think, you know, falls under that umbrella of community and social context. 
And within that um, is policy and law. And so one of the things that I'd like to shed light on later today uh, during the course of our conversation is, you know, how we can impact policy uh, to help, you know, um, improve the disparities that, that we, we see in this space. No, thank you for that. And, you know, kind of just reminding the audience, as Brandon alluded to, as we're going along, please drop your questions into the Q&A and we'll save time at the end to answer them. Um, so I guess we could just start by, you know, talking about how complex our healthcare system is, right? Um, and, you know, it's complex even for someone trying to go in for a wellness visit, yet along um, any type of chronic or new acute illness that they face. Um, I guess, you know, coming from your perspective of being, um, having kidney disease, Morgan, um, and, and going through this process, um, can you shed some light on what are some of the key challenges faced by Black individuals in navigating the healthcare system for kidney-related diseases? Absolutely. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head. You can be the savviest person and it is difficult to navigate the American healthcare system. Um, it's even harder when you're sick, right? When you're tired, when you don't really, especially when you're thinking of talking about something as specialized as kidney health and as niche as transplantation. So um, some of the barriers that patients face, I mean, we're going to start with just the, the um, disproportionate um, rate of comorbidities in the Black community. When we think about hypertension and diabetes, um, Dr. Williams just kind of alluded to some of the social determinants of health um, that impact uh, Black patients. Um, transportation, uh, lack of, you know, uh, lack of transportation, lack of um, insurance, insurance instability are some um, barriers to, to that black patients face when it comes to kidney health and access to transplantation. And if I'm gonna speak specifically about transplant, I like to think about trans the transplant journey in four buckets. There's pre-transplant care, right? So again, there's um, a disproportionate rate of comorbidities, again, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease that affect the black community. Um, there's poor CKD awareness, right? If you don't know, that you have CKD, it's really hard to, to start treating or, or, you know, yeah, to start treating your, your disease. Then we think about the transplant referral phase, right? If you're someone that has chronic kidney disease, advanced chronic kidney disease, now it's time for you to start considering kidney replacement therapy. Most people don't even know what their options are. They don't know about dialysis. They don't know about the different dialysis modalities that you can do dialysis in center or that you can do dialysis at home. And you know, when you ride through any under-resourced area in America, you'll see lots of dialysis centers. You won't see grocery stores, you won't really see parks. Um, it, you, know, you won't really see environments that are conducive to health, healthy living. Um, then we think of, and again, just with the transplant referral phase, um, there's disparate practice when it comes to referring patients for transplant. Um, there's a lot of implicit, sometimes explicit bias that keeps providers from making referrals for patients to transplant. So that's the pre-transplant care bucket, the transplant referral bucket, but then thinking about the transplant evaluation bucket. So once you have someone that has been referred to transplant, there are other um, barriers that patients face. Again, there's that provider bias, um, there's language barriers, there's no standardization when it comes to the evaluation process. And then when we think about getting onto the transplant wait list, because that's where people need to be on the transplant wait list, but there's so many hurdles to get there. Um, there's generally a lack of shared decision-making, right? Patients, well, people, I, because I, and I don't, I mean, and I know we're talking about patients, but patient is merely one aspect of a person's life. They're not just patients. They're people who are living, who have lives. And um, when we're talking about the transplant wait list, shared decision making and shared decision making goes through, you know, effect, you know, is should be included in all of these phases. But when we're talking about transplant waitlisting, we want to make sure that patients are active participants in their health care and that they're, you know, making decisions that are based on their own values um, and their livelihood. So again, those are some of the barriers that are faced during the different um, phases of the transplant journey. I hope that makes sense and that that was clear. And then I can circle back to talk about some of the policy solutions, but um, it's very difficult uh, 
uh, getting through transplant. It is a hard journey to navigate, but um, I'm excited to talk to you about some of the policy solutions. And I'm really, really excited about what the administration and the government is doing to reform, reform excuse me, reform the transplant system. Yes, thank you for that. Um, and Dr. Williams, I will turn to you to kind of, you know, speak on that. But also, if you can include, you know, coming from the provider lens, how can, you know, providers and healthcare institutions do a better job of engaging um, with Black communities to build that trust and um, health equity that, you know, we're trying to discuss today? Yeah, no, that's this is great. Uh, Morgan touched on a number of, of key topics. I mean, 37 million folks you know, um, suffer from chronic kidney disease, and yet 90% of them don't know they even have it. And so there are some just inherent issues that are related to that. And then you think about, you know, we, we've, we've sort of woven into this conversation all sorts of um, examples of social determinants of health. One is food deserts. Patients live, a lot of patients live in food deserts, and we're constantly asking them, to eat healthy, to do this, to do that, and um, without really providing the right services uh, to, to allow that to come to be. But to get to your question, I, I, I can speak to it both from you know, the lens of a patient <laughs> as well as uh, a physician and a provider. Um, having you know, had a, scare, a health scare myself with uh, congestive heart failure, acute congestive heart failure, um, and having a hit to my kidney, um, or I'll say it differently, having it impact my kidneys um, was a very scary thing. And navigating the healthcare system, even as a physician, was challenging. And so I totally get it. And I think it's part of, of sort of my uh, determination to try and make a difference um, for the, the patients, the people, right, that, that we are charged to, to serve. And so from a provider perspective, I think, you know, some of the things that we can do, and I say this now from a research perspective, is making sure um, that as we evaluate new therapies, that we include uh, a diverse population so that if that, you know, new therapy is successful and goes through all of the processes that lead to it getting approved and being out there um, for, for use, that we know how it works in every you know, sort of population. And I say that uh, with a lot of pride because at least for our studies that we have done in, um, in our dialysis patient population, we've had about a 40 to 45% representation of Blacks, uh, about a 30% representation of Hispanics in our clinical trials. So we know that the drug that we are trying to develop um, or that we developed um, works in a myriad number of patient populations. And it's, it's actually a win-win. It's like those are patients that you can access and that you can make you know, uh, you know, positive impacts in terms of the health uh, outcomes. And so I think from that perspective, those are some of the things that I think we we can we can start to do to help with the disparities that we see, particularly in 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 the kidney uh, in the kidney space. I already love the fact that this conversation can go like fifty different ways, right? You just <laughs> brought in clinical trial diversity, which we know is so important to ensure that, like you said, then we're not left out of the uh, medical advancements. Um, you know, we this data shows that like this is disproportionately impacting us, and so we need to be a part of the studies and the research to ensure that the treatments are also working for us as well. Because we've seen, you know, in the news very various treatments where, you know, we have been left out of studies and then it's like, well, will that work for the Black population who also mm -hmm. um, is impacted by this disease? And so thank you for bringing that, that um, question line up. And one of the things that I think I am curious about when thinking about transplants, tra transplant equity and having enough um, individuals who are willing to give donations is just the stigma that's in the Black community sometimes surrounding oh it. Mm -hmm. I know personally, I've heard people say things like, 
oh no, you don't want to be an organ donor because they're just going to kill you off. And, right. you know, I think coming from the healthcare side, unfortunately, you know, if you are ill or have like, you know, maybe like a car accident and you you uh, suffer substantial injuries, if those conversations are actually happening, you know, the the medical efforts to try to save you is, is not showing a lot of benefit. And it looks like, you know, your organs will be, you know, be able to be used in a manner to, to help other individuals. And so, you know, how do we come back and have those conversations within our community about what organ donation is and what that actually looks like, both from a healthy perspective, but also, you know, if you are unfortunately succumb to an illness? That's a great question. I think that, um, so one of the key stakeholders in transplant are organ procurement organizations. Um, organ procurement organizations or OPOs are tasked with matching recipients and um, with organ donors. And truly it should be the role of the OPOs to get out there and dispel those myths. And, and there are many, you know, I've heard people say too, I'm leaving here the way that I came in, I'm leaving this earth with all my organs. Or, you know, I've heard that too, you know, where people will say, I'm putting organ donor on my license. If they see, if I get into a car accident and they see I'm a donor, they're going to save my life. And that's quite the opposite. First of all, no one's looking at a license. They're trying to save your life. <laughs> no one is looking for your wallet. Um, they are trying to save your life. And when it comes to organ donation, most people don't realize to become an organ donor. So organ donation can unfold in two ways. You can become a living donor, much like my friend donated her kidney to me 17 years ago, or there's donation after one passes. And it happens in such a specialized way. I think less than 3% of all people that die will be eligible to become an organ donor. Organ donors come from ICUs. You have to be on a ventilator and most organ donors are pronounced brain dead. They're a cessation of all um, function of the brain, yet the heart still beats pumping blood and oxygen to the organs. Um, there's also organ donation after cardiac death. And I won't get into all of the nitty gritty details, but um, to answer your question, Megan, yes, there are so many myths and misconceptions. Um, but I do think, again, it's the role of organ procurement organizations to really get into their communities to provide this education. And at the National Kidney Foundation, one of the ways that we advocate is for, we know that CMS overseas, they regulate the OPOs in our, in our country, right? And um, we have advocated with CMS to let them know it's critical, one, for OPOs to have staff reflect, look like, the communities that they serve. That's one. Two, it's really important that staff have cultural sensitivity training. They understand how to speak to the communities that they serve. Um, and three, again, dispelling those myths and misconceptions um, when it comes to organ donation. Um, I also think that it's important for people to understand, especially in the Black community, whether it's living donation or deceased donation, how you can help people living in your family, in your community, within your church, at your school, with, you know, it's really important that people know that they have the power to make change. For me, listen, my family, my husband knows if anything happens to me and I can donate my organs, please do so. And if you don't, he knows I'll come back to haunt him. I don't need none of these organs when I leave here, quite frankly. My saying in life is more flesh, more flavor, but in the next life, I'd like to have Angela Bassett's body. So please, if I can have, if you can, if I can donate my organs to someone else, please take whatever you can. I love that. I love that. And, you know, Dr. Williams, you alluded to, um, you know, medical advancements. And so how can technology, you know, maybe like digital health, telehealth be leveraged to improve access to kidney care for Black individuals um, in underserved areas? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think for sure that 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 is a technology that could definitely benefit. I think uh, what's important, and, and Morgan also alluded to it as well, is making sure, though, that whoever is providing that education, that they're representative, too, of the communities that they're going forth to, to sort of try and, you know, uh, disseminate that education. There is that distrust, um, and we don't have to get into all of the reasons um, that that exists, but just know that it does, and it matters 
it matters in clinical trials that patients or that you know um you know the the, the participants see people that look like them um and that they they feel like they can trust right that is going to explain exactly what's happening to them going to you know lay out the risk and the benefits of you know of this medicine that we're we're studying but i think in terms of you know disseminating information from a digital standpoint i mean you look at the age that we're in everybody's got well a good number of people uh, have smartphones and are constantly looking up this or that or the other and so i think there are a number of ways um that we can you know what i just gave this the statistics about you know uh, CKD and 90% of folks not knowing. Well, there's all sorts of educational pieces. NKF does a wonderful job of listing, you know, just some of the simple things that can be done to actually know that. And it starts right in your household, in your family. Like you, a lot of us know that we have, you know, folks in our family, we have histories, uh, you know, parents and grandparents with hypertension, with diabetes. We should also then know that we are at risk, right, for developing those those uh, illnesses as well. And we should there should be mechanisms in place to say how can we get screened for those things to know what our risks are to actually start you know seeing if there are ways to prevent the progression of these diseases so that we don't get to uh, dialysis. Uh, or transplant, uh, you know, you know, sort of status. And so I think, you know, there, there are a myriad number of things that we can do in terms of AI, in terms of just, you know, education, outreach, all of those things um, to, to reach the masses, to, to let them know. And I think, again, it starts at home, but we can, we, certainly in the Black church, um, that's another nice sort of, place where we get a lot of our educational, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, advances as it relates to healthcare. And so I think we have to continue to do that and we need to do it uh, even more. I mean, barbershops, right? I mean, beauty shops, all of those things, things that are, you know, th that are staples of the Black community. We, we, we have to find ways to, you know, sort of disseminate the right information um, and and then it's not just disseminating that information. We've got to set up systems that follow through on that. So let's say I say, oh, wow, you may be at risk for, you know, high blood pressure or hypertension. Um, and somebody goes and they get, they get checked. We need to also make sure that there are systems in place where they can now um, have access to care and access to treatment. Um, and so all of those things uh, are, you know, decidedly important in terms of trying to impact health outcomes. Can I piggyback on that? Please. Yes. This was like an amen moment for me, Dr. Williams, because to your point, racial concordance and cultural congruency are so critical, um, as you mentioned. But as we're th thinking about um, prevention, you know, so circling back to maybe a policy solution from the pre-transplant care piece with their, you know, people not knowing that they have CKD. Prevention is so important. We have advocated with the United States Preventative Services Task Force, the USPSTF, to expand screenings as far upstream as primary care. Because when you come downstream to transplant, one thing that we know, like when we get to advanced, when people get to advanced stage um, CKD, and you know now they're looking at dialysis, we know that there's a very limited number of organs available for transplant. Um, and no one wants to, while it's, thank goodness we have dialysis to, as a life sustaining measure and as a bridge to transplant for those that want um, a transplant and can receive a transplant, but we don't want people to be that far along. We wanna mm -hmm. do as much as we can further upstream and whether that is standardizing um, education about CKD awareness, about transplant awareness, or any sort of kidney replacement therapy, expanding healthcare coverage, right? So because we can't have these screenings in place and people know what their status is, but now how do we help them? It's great that they know, but we, at to Dr. Williams' point, we need to have systems in place to help people 
um, access and receive the care that they need to treat, even prevent um, the disease. Yeah, Those are amazing points. Um, I recently had a family member call me and their blood pressure was over 200, over 100, and they're feeling ill and going to the ER and they just said, oh, you have some acute kidney injury. And I know they're going into the whole process with the nephrologist and, you know, they're concerned, right? Obviously. So, you know, you hear that, wait, I have kidney damage. What does that mean? Right. What the, you know, is this reversible? Will my diet help? You know, walking through them through, through that has just been very interesting, you know, in terms of like the education piece for them. And, you know, fortunately I can like help them a little bit, you know, but, um, you know, for many people, you know, this is a very scary world to hear those, those words. And, and, Absolutely. And, those and mm -hmm. so, oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to cut you off. No, I'm sorry. I was just agree. Absolutely. <laughs> it is scary. And, you know, I, I don't think that it's common in our culture to think about our own mortality. And right. you kind of have to start thinking about your own mortality when you hear words like you've been diagnosed with, with chronic kidney disease or, um, I'm sorry, but you know, you have kidney failure and, and now you need to be on dialysis because now what does that look like? I know for me personally as a patient, and I am an N of one, um, but I equated to, you know, when you have sand in your hand, I equated my life to sand in my hand. If you squeeze that sand too tight, it all comes dripping out of your hand and then there's nothing left. That's how I felt about dialysis in my life. What does my future look like? So it is very scary. Um, but I do think it's critically important to start equipping people with knowledge and education because we often talk about patient empowerment, but you can't empower people if they don't have education and awareness. Um, so anyway, um, that's it on that. I think that was another amen moment. So I want to turn um, back to you um, and talk about some of the reforms, you know, that you alluded to that HRSA is doing, um, you know, the Co Congresswoman Robin Kelly uh, co-led the Securing the U.S. Organ Procurement and Transportation Network Act um, with Representative Bouchon from the House. Fortunately, it made it all the way to Biden's desk side and now it's enacted Woo -hoo. into law. Um, and so, you know, these are some of the things that I think like Congress is thinking about and working through in terms of like, how do we make our transplant system more equitable and fair across the board? And so I would just love for you to speak on what's happening. Um, and then, you know, are there ways for different stakeholder groups to get involved um, in terms of what next steps and what the future looks like? Absolutely. So I I'm so excited to answer this question. I could talk for hours about this, but I'll keep it very brief. Um, so the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, oversees the transplant system, right? And for 40 years, the transplant system, one contractor has done everything for the American transplant system. And now HRSA has taken the bold move to split the contract from one vendor to multiple vendors to allow subject matter experts to bid for different parts of the contract. Um, this is an exciting time for the American organ donation and transplant system because um, now HRSA is looking at how can we make our transplant system more efficient, more equitable? How can we ensure that our transplant system is transparent? Um, at the National Kidney Foundation, we have been very strong advocates, steadfast proponents for a transplant system that keeps patients at the center of their care. So we're very excited to, for the changes that are, are to come. We know that this is a Herculean task. Um, we are supporting HRSA um, through this endeavor. I will say HRSA in their outreach, and I'm not speaking on behalf of HRSA, but we have worked very closely with the team leading the um, transformation, but they've done lots of outreach to different stakeholders in the community. I think that they've been very open to feedback. So if there are stakeholders on this call, I highly encourage you to um, reach out to her. So I will put um, a link in the chat so that you all can, can read up on uh, the modernization initiative. And I think there's also going to be a link where you can add any commentary that HRSA can um, read if you have any suggestions. One of the biggest pieces of um, 
the modern is, or I shouldn't say the biggest, but an important part of the, the modernization initiative is the collection of pre wait list data. So currently, the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network, OPTN, is only mandated to collect data from waitlisting on. So we don't have any data on who is referred for transplant and who makes it through the evaluation phase. And now that is included in the modernization initiative. This is a very critical piece of data to collect, especially for the Black community, because now we're um, researchers, physicians, um, the government can now take a closer look at who's being referred for transplant, who is not being referred, who's making it through the evaluation process, who isn't, and why, and starting to close some of those disparity gaps in access to transplantation. This is really, really important. Last year, well, let me just start by saying there are almost 90,000 people on the transplant wait list waiting for a life-saving kidney transplant right now. Last year, there were 27,000 um, oh, just over 27,300 kidney transplants performed. Of the 27,000, 7,362 Black people received a kidney transplant, despite the fact that um, there are 26,599 people wait, Black people waiting for a transplant. So again, there's a, there's a huge disparity. I do think that the collection of pre-wait listing data, again, something that NKF and many others have advocated for, um, we're excited to see that this is something that's included in the modernization initiative. And it's 2024. You know, we it's time for us to kind of level up and step our game up because when you look at different transplant programs throughout the world, it, some people are really killing it and, and we should be killing it too. We should have a best in class transplant system because it's what people in this country deserve, regardless of race, regardless of immigration status, regardless of um, someone's zip code, everyone deserves access to the transplant system. It should not just be reserved for the haves. Um, those that are underserved deserve access to, and it's up to our administration to ensure that everyone no matter what we look like, no matter where we live, have access to, to transplantation as a life-saving therapy. No, thank you so much for that overview. And I know like we're super excited to see where this goes, trying to make sure, you know, one of the things that we will continue to watch um, is appropriation funding. So, you know, HRSA is receiving the dollars that they need. Um, I hope I didn't just cut out. My camera looked like it just went on and off um, to, to implement these things. So we will continue to watch that. And Dr. Williams, you know, I definitely want to make sure you talk about, you know, what policy challenges are impacting health equity in the dialysis, dialysis community and what do we need to additional policies that we need to look for to, to, to try to support and advocate for? Yeah, no, thanks for that question, Megan. I, I think just so the audience understands, you know, once a patient gets on dialysis, you know, Medicare has basically been the primary payer for patients with kidney failure in the U.S., and that's been the case since 1972. And basically, um, in 2011, uh, CMS devised a, instead of, you know, they, they shifted from a fee-for-service sort of payment system to what we call um, the prospective, the ESRD prospective payment system. We also know that as the bundle. And what that does is it's a fixed payment for um, the dialysis itself, for the medications that are given during dialysis, for the equipment and for the staff that are taking care of that patient when he or she is sitting in the dialysis chair. Um, and that's a fixed amount, right? And so you know, one of the reasons that this uh, that this system was put into place was because there was felt to be an overuse of certain drugs uh, that are used uh, for patients who have kidney failure, namely uh, the drugs that treat anemia. Um, but since that time, other drugs have been added to um, to the bundle system, um, and these drugs, you know, are used to again treat other complications that happen as a result of the kidney uh, not working. And when you think about all of the abnormalities, all of the, you know, sort of uh, complications that happen when the kidneys fail, one of the most important ones, um, or the one that is that has the most attributable risk 
of causing death um, is phosphorus. Because normally the phosphorus that we take into our bodies, we're able to excrete most of that in our kidneys. But when the kidneys fail, that then goes away um, and your serum phosphorus level goes up. And with every milligram increase in your phosphorus, there is an associated increase uh, in your um, uh, risk of morbidity and mortality. And so for that reason, um, there are guidelines that tell us that we should always try in these patients to make sure that we try to lower their serum phosphorus toward the normal level. Um, and when you think about, you know, sort of drugs that we use or that have historically been used to do that, well, before we go to drugs, you know, the non-pharmacological methods, people will say, well, you, you can, you know, decrease the intake of food that has a lot of phosphorus. Well, phosphorus is ubiquitous in our foods. Um, it's actually in, it's, it's a, there's a lot of phosphorus in processed foods, but there's also phosphorus in good foods like fish and nuts <laughs> and eggs. Um, and, and so it's, you can't just say, you know, you know, why, why don't you just take in less? Again, a lot of patients live in food deserts and that's just not, um, a, you know, a possibility. The second way that you could do it is probably by increasing the frequency um, and the duration of dialysis, but that is hugely burdensome. Right now, patients go to dialysis for three times a week, um, and they're dialyzed for at least three or four hours per session. Um, and no one, I mean, so logistically, being able to increase, you know, the number of days um, without it being just home dialysis is just, is not practical. So, for that reason, most of the, 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 the main way that we control serum phosphorus, uh, at least for the last five decades, has been with phosphate binders. And these are drugs that you take uh, by mouth and they basically absorb the phosphorus that's, you know, that you've taken in in your diet. Um, until recently, we got a new drug approved. It's, it's our drug. It's a phosphate, instead of a binder, it's a phosphate blocker. But you also need to take that in association with food. And so one of the worries that we have, because we've seen this with the bundle system, we've seen that certain drugs have been put into the bundle system. And as a result of that, dialysis patients have limited access to those newer drugs because they cost more. And again, it's a fixed rate, right? And so, um, what we've seen is that there's a decrease in access to those new, more innovative drugs. We've seen that uh, the, the shared decision-making that generally happens between the patient and the physician is taken away because there is a protocol at the, at the dialysis organization that says, these are the drugs that we're going to use. You know, I think uh, I liken it to, you know, sort of formularies. There are certain drugs that are on the formulary and certain drugs that are not. But the bottom line is that there's a decrease in access. And so one of the, you know, one of the proposals is to now put these phosphate lowering drugs also into the bundle. They're not in there now, right now. Um, they're actually paid for outside of the bundle in Medicare Part D. And so if we put those drugs in the bundle, our worry is that, again, that patients actually will suffer. Because right now, about 80% of dialysis patients are taking drugs like phosphate binders, right? Um, and nearly 80% of them um, are not getting to their target goals. They're, in other words, their phosphate, phosphate levels are not being controlled. And so the hope is that newer therapies actually help patients get more control. If you put these drugs in the bundle, then you limit access to, to the newer drugs. I mean, I, I guess another example would be, look at diabetes. You know, if people were just limited to metformin and were not able to get some of the newer drugs like Jardians or um, Ozempic, uh, again, that's, that's limiting access, that's decreasing uh, the likelihood that people are gonna get to the levels that we want them to get to. And so from a policy standpoint, the, the government has acted three times in the past to block 
that legislation to block basically um, putting these phosphate lowering drugs into the bundle. First and foremost, they're oral only. They, they don't have an injectable equivalent and they can't be given during a dialysis session. They have to be given with food and you can't eat during dialysis. So it's unprecedented to even put them in the bundle. Um, but as I said, three times in the past, the government has acted to say, no, this isn't the right thing to do. We don't think this is good for patients. Um, but that last time, the law, the, the, the legislature that allowed that, that prevented them from going in, that expires on January the 25th, I'm sorry, January 1st of 2025. And so if Congress doesn't act again, those drugs will go into the bundle and all of the things that I just alluded to, patient access, patient choice, um, shared decision-making, uh, potentially less control of their serum phosphorus, all of those things come into play. And so we have, you know, there's a new legislature that's been um, uh, proposed um, and it's, it's the Kidney Patient Act, it's HR 5074. It was introduced last year in August um, uh, by uh, Representative uh, Buddy Carter um, and co-signed by um, Congresswoman uh, Custer, Carol Miller, and Terry Sewell. And there are a host of other Congress members that have now signed on as well. And in terms of organizations, you know, NMQF, NAACP, New York, uh, National Hispanic Medical, HEAL. I mean, there's a kidney care partners. The bottom line is that there's really no organization that stands against this legislation. We just need to get it passed because um, I think that is really one of those things. When I talk about policy and law uh, as in terms of a social determinant of health, that is a policy that has the potential, I think, to um, adversely or widen the gap uh, that we are already seeing in terms of health disparities. So from a policy standpoint, that's something that I think is really, really important um, for dialysis patients. No, thank you both for those great, um, you know, actionable policy advocacy things that people can uh, follow up with for uh, their, their representatives as well as the agencies. So we have... Um, a few questions in the chat. And so um, I'll turn it over there. So we have a question that says, um, do you see a role for community health navigators in kidney care treatment centers and working with patients? How can they be integrated into a model of care? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I think a policy solution to um, patients having a difficult time navigating the transplant system, I think a good policy solution to that would be um, a payment mechanism for community health workers. I don't think they're utilized enough and I don't think they're paid well enough either. And so I think at, not only that, I think that they um, could be incredibly beneficial um, to patients and to uh, healthcare systems. So I say yes, there are actual um, healthcare systems that are utilizing community health workers in a beneficial way. Um, I would encourage you to look up and I'll have to see if I can find this. But Dr. Lilia Cervantes is a nephrologist in Colorado and she has a pretty robust community health worker program. Um, and I'm sure there are many other examples of that as well, but yes. Yeah, and I echo I, I echo Morgan's comments. I think, um, you know, again, one of the things that we talked about earlier in our discussion was uh, the importance of um, patient advocates and patient and, and 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 you know community leaders that look like the patient themselves. I mean, we need. I, I think that's really really important. And so um, I, I know that again. Um, when we talk about you know some of the educational needs right people understanding that they might be at risk and how you might you know sort of go about screening them and treating them nkf does a wonderful job there and and by the way nkf is also supportive of uh, the 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 legislation that i just alluded to in in my uh in my discussion in terms of policy but 
I absolutely agree. Community, the community educators would play it. A, well, they already do, but increasing them and uh, to Morgan's point, making sure that they're actually, um, you know, you know, sort of uh, th 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 that they are appropriately you know, sort of paid and, and reimbursed for their time and their expertise is, is also very important. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And I saw someone come in and say, are you saying we should support HR 5074 or not? And Dr. Williams, I would say you were saying support. HR. Support, 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 because <laughs> what that will do is that will extend um, this whole concept of not putting uh, these phosphate lowering therapies in the bundle. That is what that's for. Because again, Congress has seen three times in the past that this is not the right thing to do. And they've passed similar legislation to prevent those phosphate lowering therapies from going into the bundle. And this legislation would basically extend um, uh, that concept. So support, you can, I mean, yes, support, write a letter, do whatever you can do. If you're in an organization that, uh, again, is an advocate to, to kidney health, uh, send, send in the letter. Talk to your state and local legislation, le legislatures, but support by all means, support. And in that same vein, really quickly, as we're thinking about advocacy, if there are providers that are on the call um, or people in general, everyone needs an advocate. Kidney yes. patients need advocates. Again, when you're sick and you're not feeling well, you need someone to support you. Advocacy can take place on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. If you're a provider, you can advocate on an individual level, listen to your patients, um, amplify shared decision-making, look patients eye to eye. Don't like, as a patient, don't stand over me. If you want me to trust you and you wanna take a moment, take a beat, look me in my eye systems level advocacy. Dr. Danae Simpson from Northwestern has implemented the African-American Transplant Access Program. She has made systems level change at her um, health system to create a pathway for Black people to have access to transplant. You can advocate on the state and federal level, like Dr. Williams just said, advocating for policies. I'm going to go ahead and uh, selflessly name drop our Living Donor Protection Act, which um, protects living donors from being discriminated against when it comes to life insurance, long-term care insurance. Um, you can also, you know, make your voice heard. Part There are so many patient advocacy organizations that you can partner with. Um, at NKF, we have lots of councils. We have our public policy council. I lead, I co-lead our transplant advisory committee. We have a health equity advisory committee. Link up with an organization to have your voice heard. Um, advocacy, again, can take place in a multitude of ways. So I encourage you to, to use your voice in any way that you can to advocate for patients. No, I think those are, are great, um, you know, feedback. And it alludes to one of the questions um, that's in the chat regarding, you know, this person said Black patients pain is sometimes not taken as seriously as that their counterparts. And there's a significant issue in healthcare and reflects broader disparities in medical treatment? How can patients or their families continue to advocate for them when the cars are stacked against them to get tested for CKD? And, you know, a question that I always kind of think through in terms of when we're saying, you know, you need to advocate for yourself. I always think about like healthcare is a different language almost, right? Mm -hmm. You're asking someone to, who speaks French, you know, <laughs> to talk in German. And like, how do you articulate what you're feeling and what you're seeing when you're not even 100% quite sure what you're even dealing with, right? You know, it, and it can be as little as, you know, I have pain. Well, you know, I, you know, coming from the healthcare side, you're like, well, is it throbbing? Is it acute? Is it dull? Is it this? You know, you're just like, like, have we taught individuals the different, even just even the different types of pain of how you would articulate what you are feeling? And so, you know, I think that's one of the things that I still wrestle with is like, how do I better educate and inform people of how to talk the language of healthcare? But then on the flip side of that coin, it's almost like 
should you need to do all this additional education when, you know, we should be listening as providers, you know, to make sure that what you're telling us, we're kind of helping navigate what you're trying to, ex you know, explain to us into that like second language. And so I don't know if you have anything else to talk about like that advocate advocating for patients because I think you alluded to it so beautifully but I will say you know when I'm talk, thinking and talking about this that is one of the things that I continue to like struggle with when helping to educate uh people on various d disease prognosis yeah I think you know certainly uh from an educational standpoint you know medical schools for example are starting to train uh you know uh uh future physicians to make sure um, in, uh, around the cultural sensitivity of even language, like how to communicate with patients who might speak a different language. And I don't mean French versus English. I mean, the, the dialect may be different. The, the, you know, the cultural style may be different. How do you make sure that you are actually, you know, when you're trying to get a history that you are actually talking that language, you're speaking that language. And a lot of that, to your point, it, is, it starts with listening. It really does. It starts with listening. Um, and then, based on what you hear, asking additional clarifying questions. So I think on, on that side of the coin, on the physician, you know, healthcare provider side, we have to be more in tune, right, to the patient. We, we, we've got to be willing to learn that language. And then on the other side, on the patient side, um, I think we've got to, we've got to like one of the, I mean, one of, I think the, the key characteristics of advocacy is just saying, if you don't understand, no, can you explain that more? Um, don't be afraid. Don't, I mean, I know a lot of times we are afraid to, that we might look, um, you know, uh, not as intelligent or whatever, just throw that aside. At the end of the day, this is your health. If somebody's telling you that something's wrong and you don't know quite what they're telling you, tell them to explain it to you better. That is their job. And so I think it, there, there, are, there, there are things that need to happen on both sides, but certainly on the HCP, the healthcare provider side, we have got to do a better job in eliciting, you know, the information. And we have to, you know, break it down to a, a level that, you know, that patient understands. And and we have to ask them. We, we, we shouldn't leave the room without, you know, saying, uh, you know, do you have other questions? Do you understand, you know, sort of what I'm, what the issues are? Do, do you understand the next steps? Do, you know, we, we, we have to do that, so. Absolutely, because when you think about health literacy, again, it's really difficult navigating the healthcare system. And, you know, for the providers on the call too, language is really important. To just piggyback off of what Dr. Williams said, it's so important to meet patients where they are, but right. also the language that providers use in their charting is very important. Terms like not adherence, non-compliant, hostile, um, not willing to participate, you know, these are things that hurt Black patients. These are things that hurt patients in general, but these are terms that hurt Black patients, especially patients looking for transplant. If a transplant center sees terms like non-compliance, non-adherence, that is a massive deterrent to list that patient for transplant because it lets that transplant center know, well, if they're not compliant with their dialysis treatment, if they're not compliant with you know, their medication, then they're not going to be compliant when they get their, their transplant. So just thinking about language right. um, in, in different ways, it's important for patients, one, to, to communicate and, and be unafraid to say, I don't understand. But I think on the flip side of that coin, there's a responsibility on providers to ensure that they're meeting patients where they are, but being very careful about the language that's being used, especially in nephrology and at dialysis centers, because again, that can be very harmful to patients seeking transplant. Thank y'all for that. And it feels like this has gone so quickly. We're at the last five minutes of this webinar. And so I just wanna turn it over to the both of you. Um, um, Morgan, you can go first. What are some parting last words you wanna leave us with? 
Well, first of all, I want to give a lot of gratitude to um, Representative Kelly for the work that she did on the SUS OPTN Act. That has been um, a big deal to help drive the change that we need to reform our transplant system. But um, I wanted to circle back really quickly for just a few policy solutions to improve barriers to transplantation. And a few of those include expanding healthcare coverage, standardizing education um, so that people understand what their kidney replacement therapy options are. Again, someone brought up community health workers. So making sure that there's a payment mechanism for, for that. Um, policies that improve digital, um, digital health equity. Uh, policies that um, amplify the need for shared decision-making, expanding screenings for CKD testing. I can go on and on, but these are just some of the things that we're advocating for at the National Kidney Foundation. But again, I just want to thank you, Megan. It has been an honor to be on this panel with you, Dr. Williams. Um, big shout out to the National Minority Quality Forum for hosting these webinars and amplifying the voices of people like myself, like you, Dr. Williams, and Tr really trying to drive change to close the disparity chasm for Black patients. We deserve access to high quality health care too. So um, I'm going to continue to get in good trouble, like <laughs> Representative John Lewis, in fighting this good fight to ensure that we all have access to, to high quality health care. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Dr. Williams? Yeah. Yeah, I echo Morgan's comments. I, I mean, she's spot on with all of them. I think for me, you know, the biggest piece is I, one of my mantras has always been the patients are waiting. Um, it's 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 one thing to try and develop, you know, innovative drugs that you know address unmet need, but it's entirely uh, another thing to make sure that patients have access to them. You know, and so. It, it's really important for us to, again, when you, you you know look at one of the social determinants of health, it's the healthcare system, health coverage, provider availability, provider bias, you know, uh, quality of care, access to drugs, um, all of those things. Um, and I think, you know, when I look at you know the impact that policy and law can have on health outcomes, it is enormous. And it, it, is in, it is, you know, incumbent upon all of us to make sure that we do whatever we can to make sure that the policies and the laws that are in place, um, that they're there for good, like that they, they are there to um, assure um, that patients have access to care, have access to innovative therapies, that there is shared decision-making um, and that they have choice. Uh, no one, I mean, that's, that. those are just essential things. Those are things that, um, that we should in, expect. They're not entitlements. They're things that are actual, you know, social good. And that's, it's the right thing to do. And so I uh, too want to thank uh, you, Megan, uh, NMQF, uh, really excited to be on this panel. It was a pleasure uh, hanging out with Morgan again. And uh, uh, really, uh, this is a topic I could I, I could talk about for, for a long time, but I really appreciate you guys shedding light uh, on the issues. Um, and hopefully we can we can uh, we can move the needle forward. Amazing. I don't think there's anything left to be said. So thank you. Thank you both for being on this panel for, you know, when we reached out, you graciously accepted. So thank you. I'm so full and just re-energized to continue, uh, you know, the advocacy in this space. I know that our audience has gotten a lot from it. And hopefully um, this panel has brought forth a diverse perspectives to seek action and collaborate on to improve our uh, kidney disease and kidney trans and just transplant in general equity uh, in totality. So thank you both. Um, and I'll turn it over to Brandon Garrett. Oh no, I don't. I don't have much to say besides just thank you. I just was putting myself on the screen. I've been in the background listening and learning. So just thank you guys for doing this and uh, our audience for participating. Got tons of questions. Hope hopefully most or all of them got answered. And then just last reminder: if you're uh, interested or know someone interested, have them apply for the forty under forty. The links in the chat. With that.
Have a good weekend, folks. Thanks so much. Bye.